I'm Brett from Heinemann, and today on the podcast, we're excited to welcome Carla España and Luz Yadira Herrera, authors of En Comunidad, Lessons for Centering the Voices and Experiences of Bilingual Latinx Students. Both Carla and Luz infuse their own experiences as bilingual Latinx students into their writing and teaching, urging teachers to create liberating spaces for their students by embracing a practice known as translanguaging. They assert that educators must center and study the language practices in students' lives and texts, helping both children and teachers think about their ideas on language. I started out by asking the authors about the school experience of U.S. Latinx students. Carla begins our conversation. So I think the experience for U.S. Latinx students is really complex and varied. So we have, we definitely, just like how we talk about the complexity of Latinx identities, we also have to talk about the complexity of those experiences in schools. And so you have some students who might go to school where there might be bilingual programs, and those bilingual programs might be very open to welcoming their full linguistic repertoire in the language practices. And so they might flow and use their entire language repertoire in those programs. You might have programs with the same names across the state district and the school in across a few blocks away, like I, I am in New York City and I see this all the time, where the programs might be named to the same, but their experiences might be very different because they might be called dual language bilingual programs, but it might have very fixed language separation. And so the students might be told you cannot speak in English on a Spanish day, or you cannot speak a Spanish on an English day. And um, that is very confining, constricting to their, their language practices and their identities and the ways they, they've grown up. And those are some of the experiences around uh, specific programs and the way they look like and how that affects um, U.S. Latinx students. But I know Luz can also talk about students outside of those programs and what their experiences might be like. I do want to add a little bit about the difference in California that we have, right? Because um, California just got out of a almost 20 year essential ban on bilingual education because of Proposition 227, which was recently overturned with Proposition 58 in 2016. So now we're seeing a huge expansion of bilingual programs across the state uh, to the point where we can't keep up with the demand. I'm at a school right now, it has five classes in kindergarten that are bilingual, five in first grade, five in second grade, and every year they're going to add a new grade. So that's huge. That's one of the biggest, you know, class numbers that we've had that I've seen personally. And I've, and I've been able to work with that school uh, closely this semester because I'm a professor in residence for their bilingual teacher residency program. But um, like Carla says, you can't really boil it down to one experience, right? We have to recognize that bilingual Latinx children experience their bilingualism in schooling in different ways. Sometimes they're schooling you know, does value their bilingualism. Sometimes schooling does not at all recognize it. And that's something that's very real for for Latinx students across the country. And I also think that in, like I was just talking about bilingual dual language programs, but there are students who go into schools that don't have that kind of support. And so it might look like they're being pulled out or getting support with an extra adult in the classroom that meets with them in small groups. And there's so many co-teaching models that, that schools have um, supported teachers with. And in some of those spaces, those students feel really welcomed and they're in classrooms with students who speak other languages and they don't feel alone and like a newcomer in that sense. But in other cases, they might not. And so they might be completely ignored or they might not receive any kind of support in terms of text availability or curriculum where they see themselves represented. And so that's um, an experience that's very real, especially when I was thinking about when I was working with uh, teachers in New York City and they had a selection of curriculum and they're always looking at, does the curriculum really represent um, our students that we're teaching? Um, And so that's a very real issue that we we, um, take on in this book. Well, and so, and on that note, Carla, how can schools center bilingual Latinx students? Yeah, so I think one of the... For us, it was really important that we began our book with talking about the work that we have to do as teachers. Um, And it's something that both of us do in our teacher preparation programs uh, with graduate students, with whether they might be in-service or pre-service teachers, undergrads or graduate students, meaning that I refuse to go into lesson planning and give you like, let me give you the top five strategies without first us unpacking our own assumptions right, our own ideas, our own language ideologies. And a lot of us, we all bring them to the classrooms and we sometimes reinscribe them or we make this vicious cycle that it keeps going on if we don't, if they go unchecked. 
And so what we do, one of the things we talk about in the book, and that's um, our first and second chapters that really set this up, is saying how can we as teachers first unpack our own language ideology? So think about our own moments where we feel that our language practices and our identities have been privileged, moments where they haven't been and why not? So issues of language and power come up. And so that's one of the, for us, is like the starting point, start with ourselves and that way we reject that deficit approach that usually says, well, the problem is the children and we have to fix or, or add on or give them this academic language. And what we're saying is that, no, the issue here is not that the students are, the students are the issue. The issue here is that us as adults, as teachers, as educators, we must start with our own language ideologies. And so that for us is one of the, the major approaches that we take is uh, consider how we can unpack those. And from there, we can then start getting to know our students. So a little, Luce will talk a little bit about what we talk about in the book and in terms of addressing how we can get to know our students better. Yes, absolutely. I think, well, of course, we have to start with ourselves and then we have to think about how we can approach teaching of our students and um, just creating spaces for them to tell their own stories and um, creating a classroom community where they feel that they are valued and, and trusted and loved. Uh, one of the things that we talk about in our book is uh, the approach, the three T's, I think, Ophelia Garcia, that's what she ended up calling it. Um, we, we, we approach our lessons thinking about a topic, uh, texts, and translanguaging, right? A topic that is relevant to students' experiences, students' varied experiences, uh, topics that are relevant to their lives, their communities, et cetera, as well as texts that celebrate these identities and these varied experiences. Um, and finally, translanguaging, right? That really honors uh, students' language practices and uses those language practices in the classroom, really centering them in the classroom. Luz, I want to I want to stick with that. Actually, a large portion of of how you get us into the beginning of the book is translanguaging, and it's very important in the element of your book. Can you talk a little bit more about what is translanguaging and how how does it help students? Translanguaging is simply the way bilingual people communicate. Um, translanguaging is both a pedagogical approach, but also a theory and a philosophy. And um, translanguaging is the way that I think bilingual people just make sense of their bilingual worlds, right? And, and Ophelia Garcia is the one that really has pushed this concept forward. And it's really about using our entire linguistic repertoire to make meaning, to connect, uh, to, to learn, and to teach. It's about erasing some of those linguistic boundaries that sometimes, you know, schools or other institutions impose on people, especially bilingual children. And so those boundaries are really important to consider. When you think about bilingual and multilingual learners, you think about these like boundaries around named languages. So there's Arabic and there's Spanish and there's English and there's these like confined, bounded um, languages. And that just doesn't work for bilingual, multilingual beings, right? So we don't think in these like boxed categories. There's no switch in my brain for me to go to like Spanish thinking, English thinking. And so with translanguaging, it looks at these language practices as a long one language repertoire. And I love clarifying, at least the, the way I've been doing this with students and teachers, the distinction between using the term translanguaging and code switching. And so a lot of people will say, oh, that's the same. And I've loved sharing that well, for us, the way we've been using translanguaging, translanguaging is an insider's view of our own bilingual, multilingual practices, code switching as an outsider's view of what someone is doing, because they're, they're seeing these as separate codes. And for us, we don't see this as separate. It's just one. Another uh, reference we make in our book as we define translanguaging is to a beautiful um, article written by Camila Leiva, a former New York City high school teacher and uh, Ophelia Garcia, where they looked at translanguaging in three parts. As Luz mentioned, translanguaging is the communicate the ways that bilingual, multilingual beings communicate. Two, translanguaging as pedagogy. So I think of my days when I was teaching sixth grade and I would be reading a read aloud in um, Spanish. And some of the students, when they would break out into their conversations with their notes, their note taking would reflect Spanish and English features. And it would be Spanish features from different parts of Dominican Republic and different parts of Mexico. And I would respond with Spanish features from Chile, where I'm from. And so there was a lot of translanguaging happening there as I taught and as they communicated. And the third part, translanguaging and social justice, is really using this concept, this pedagogy, this communication as a way to validate the language practices of so many of us, where our language practices have been minoritized, have been set aside, have been marginalized. And so it's time to elevate it and, and create spaces for it. 
I'd like to come back to identity. You both spoke about how powerful it is a minute ago. And really, in your book, it is also a powerful element throughout as you both write about each of your personal journeys as bilingual students. Could you each sort of take a moment now and just sort of share with us a little bit about each of your journeys? Well, I, um, I moved to the United States, to L.A. specifically, from Mexico when I was a little girl. I started third grade here. And um, my third grade teacher didn't speak any Spanish, um, even though I grew up in a community where it was probably half immigrant, you know, Mex- from Mexico mostly. But she was able to sit me next to a, a bilingual buddy, Harvey. I'll never forget his name. And um, he's just kind of the person that I always think about through like the beginning of my journey, just kind of helping me navigate this new environment, this new language, new, just everything. And I think that's where my journey kind of began. But um, I think what was most important for us is our ability that we had uh, growing up to go back and forth to our home uh, or home country. And this was something that we did every year around Christmas time. We'd pack up, you know, our SUV or van or whatever car we had at that time and drove for two days down to Mexico. And for me, that was a really an essential part of this journey because it made me feel connected to my homeland and made me feel like I belonged somewhere. I, it made me feel like I, you know, I really was proud of my language and my culture and my identity because I had that close connection. And I valued my language because I, was, I wanted to be able to communicate with my cousins, with my family. And I think that's one way that, that has helped me, at least in this bilingual journey, in really making sure that I, you know, that I held it in a high kind of regard, I guess. And um, I didn't really experience bilingual education myself, but I was able to, of course, use language at home. And I kept up my own reading uh, just so that I can keep improving on it. Again, just my close connection to home just really helped. And just overall, my overall development as a bilingual person. For me, I came from Chile to New York City when I was five years old. And I arrived with my mom. We had been separated from my dad for about a year. And my mom said she couldn't continue living that way. Um, And she really wanted us to be closer to my dad and and to raise me with him. And so we made it to New York City. We arrived as undocumented immigrants. And that um, identity marker was very real. And I I felt it and I continue to feel it, even though I'm now documented. I remember like driving past, every time I drive past this um, on Queens Boulevard in Queens, New York, this place where my mom and I had gotten lost when I was little. I still feel like I had this physical reaction to the um, fear and the the tears start flowing anytime I pass by that place. And so growing up with that, I knew that like there were certain spaces we couldn't go to. There were certain things. I obviously couldn't travel for a while um, to Chile and I ended up going to a school in Queens um, that had a representation from so many different languages. And I made friends from people from all over and it made me feel less alone, but I felt very frustrated because all the, instruction was in English. And I, I remember being taken with a group of students from different countries who were learning English to like this small little room, which seemed like a closet. And we would just do, you know, worksheets and English grammar, um, that kind of support. And my parents decided to put me in Saturday school. That was only, it was fully in Spanish. And it was this Argentinian school. And every Saturday I would go and I would learn like Argentinian history and music and dance. And as a Chilean, it was uh, great because it connected me to our neighbors not only neighbors like countrywide Chile and Argentina as neighbors, but also our neighbors from our building were from Argentina who told us about the school. And so I grew up Monday to Friday feeling really much like like not enough or less than like I still had to work really hard and really frustrated as a child in school. But Saturdays I felt like super smart and I was participating and I danced and I sang. And I think to this day that plays a big role as to why I love performing. But later on as I got um as I was able to to get my papers with my family, we started just like loose. We, we had um, traveling and visiting family became a huge part of my identity as this connection. And I know that's a, a privilege um, that I have now and I'm constantly aware of it and saying how the big impact it had that I was able to see my grandparents and I was able to communicate with them and, and continue and I wrote letters to them. But it, it really was something that growing up um, has really informed my own practice as a teacher to consider 
that journey across not only uh, geographical regions, but also journeys from within and trying to figure out like, who am I? That question of like, what does it mean to be an American? How do I fit into this culture? And are people going to welcome me? And should I change for people or should I not? And that's something that we constantly grapple with. And I, and I constantly grapple that, with that question with my students as well. What about you, Luz? How did your experience form your journey to becoming a bilingual teacher educator? That's a, that's, that's a great question. I think I didn't originally intend to be a teacher. I wanted to actually go into education, but into counseling. When I was in high school, I was a peer counselor. So that was just kind of in my mind, I'm going to be a counselor. I wanted to work in education in some way and definitely through counseling, I thought. And so when I went into undergrad, I was able to work with this program that outreaches into, into high schools like the one that I went to, Inglewood High, and advise students on college applications, FAFSA, and all of those things. And it was just kind of like, yes, for sure, I need to be a, a college counselor or some, some sort of counselor. But um, I had the opportunity after college to begin a master's program and go into teaching, and that completely changed my tra- uh, trajectory. I taught for about seven years in Harlem in New York City. And um, I think it was just that moment that, or that time that I realized that I wanted to pursue higher education so that I could have just a a larger impact in in my own way, I guess, with uh, teachers in education. And so that's why I joined the doctoral program to, to become a teacher educator. And I didn't actually start as a bilingual teacher. I was never a bilingual teacher. I was an ESL teacher, or I, they call it uh, ELD teacher now, right? English language development teacher. And I think it was or English a, as a new language here. A, oh, right. <laughs> so English much terminology everywhere. So many different terms. Yeah. So English <laughs> as a new language teacher. And um, I think it was that experience of working with those uh, groups of students that I realized that we were not doing enough. It wasn't enough just to teach English. It was important to also think about ways for students to develop, maintain their bilingualism. And so that's what turned me around. That's what led me to a path to pursue uh, research and more teaching uh, around bilingualism and bilingual education because of those injustices that I really witnessed and I felt like I took part in. You both mentioned the terminology a second ago. And in your book, you note the importance in your work about using the term emergent bilingual learner or EBL rather than the term ELL for English language learner. So why, why is it important to you? Why is it important in your work to use emergent bilingual learner? So this is another term that was actually coined by Ophelia Garcia. And of course, uh, she is our mentor. She was our our graduate uh, dissertation advisor as well. And she's also the forward author for our book. So you'll see, you'll, you'll hear us talking a lot about Ophelia Garcia. Ophelia Garcia coined this term emergent bilingual learner as a way to move away from sort of deficit perspectives like English language learner that focuses on learning English and attaining English and really shifting our perspective to developing a bilingualism or bilingual outlook really centering students' bilingualism and looking at their home language practices as something that is valued and important to maintain and and sustain and develop. Do you want to add anything, Carla? No, I think uh, for me, it's important to also connect it to that line that you just said earlier, responding to the other question and saying it wasn't enough. And I feel like uh, sometimes we go through the motions of just teaching and going through with the terminology that might be in our graduate programs or in our schools. And I think one of the ways that we can push against that is really changing the ways that we're labeling students. And I think it's it's a big deal. And students are more than just um, a, 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 bot, a learner that's focusing on learning English. Like they're bringing something to the table. They're navigating tremendous things in their lives, considering they're just like Luz was discussing her own journey, like navigating multiple cultures, languages, experiences. And so I think pushing against those, those labels that are, come from really a deficit mindset is powerful. So I'm, and I would even push further and say like, yeah, we use EBL as, as an umbrella term or emergent bilingual, um, but also acknowledging that a lot of students might be multilingual. A lot of students, um, you know, are, are navigating multiple language practices. When I was teaching in Harlem, just like uh, Luz was also teaching there, um, I had students who were not only speaking two languages like Spanish and English, but I had students who were speaking different languages from Mexico that were in Spanish. 
And so as a teacher, it put me in a position to learn from them, right? And be aware of their really complex language practices. With that, Carla, how can teachers who don't speak Spanish use translanguaging in their classroom? Oh, you just reminded me of, um, I was once in this coaching group with Colleen Cruz, who we love, another Heinemann author too. Um, And Colleen had encouraged us in this coaching group to take up an activity where we would be learning something that was challenging for us. And that would put us in the position to like grow in empathy of our students who are also learning and so many things in our classrooms. Um, And at that time, I took up guitar because I wanted to learn. And I love that observing the teacher and how the moves that the teacher was making and making me feel like very welcomed and that I could play these chords. And she sat me next to the students who were just like approximating where I was, uh, which is great. And so that's what I think of when teachers who say, well, I'm not a bilingual speaker. I'm a monolingual teacher. And we acknowledge that like most of our teaching course is like white monolingual women. And we're saying with our book, you too can do this. In fact, like you too should do this. And so that might mean like I had to do this when I had to learn from my students who are from Yemen and speaking Arabic. It might mean I'd have to learn the language practices of my students. And so I'll grab a little notebook and start listening to them, get some phrases. It also means engaging in what, um, when students are producing texts that are show their full linguistic repertoire. So if a student is writing in Spanish and English and us saying, let me welcome that kind of writing and I can learn from that as well, taking up that kind of practice. I also think if we are literacy teachers, if we are historians and we're teaching, we're social studies teachers, whatever content area we teach, um, we also see ourselves as like, well, I'm engaging in reading history articles and I'm teaching these history articles. Well, if I am in any content course in any English language arts classroom, I'm also teaching how you communicate these things. I should also be a part uh, as a learner, be a part of this community. And so just as I, as I walk into schools with my reader's notebook, my writer's notebook, my, the books I'm reading, I also walk in these spaces saying like we're also continuing to learn these language practices. And so what that might look like for some teachers, we engage in some book clubs. I've had, uh, that was one of my favorite things to do with teachers. This has been teachers saying like, you know what? I started with a podcast or I started with an app and I say, great. Like you're listening to Radio Ambulante podcast that has the, the transcription in English and Spanish for these uh, investigative journalism stories from Latin America. Beautiful. Now here you have the text on the screen. You're listening to this in Spanish. Now we can grab some articles and some books. And so moving from there. But I think that would grow, that would help the teachers grow in empathy and also establish a connection with the students. Just to add to that, you know, it, it really takes a teacher that is that sees themselves as a co-learner, right? That uh, sees their children or their students as a as a resource in a way. So students um, are able, are the experts. Students are the language experts in this case, right? And so teachers can uh, teachers can use that expertise to add to her teaching uh, practice. Teachers can also think about how to bring in the caregivers or the community into the classroom to help with the translanguaging aspect of it. And also CUNY NISA launched a web series to address a specific topic, like how can I engage in translanguaging even when I'm not bilingual or multilingual? So that's a worthy resource to check out as well. I want to end with this. Uh, You quote in the book, author Meg Medina in referring to the importance of using bilingual language, saying that this shows trust. Can you speak a little bit to the issue of trust and how important that is in this work? Oh, we love Meg. Meg is like la madrina of our (laughs) children's literature. We wanted to quote, to include that quote from Meg Medina and really talking about trusting students. And for us, it means that we are centering the students. So that means when you center something, just like that's in our title, you have to take something away from there. So we are decentering this like typical teacher authoritative figure that bearer of all knowledge and uh, teaching English to these English language learners as has been painted this narrative. And instead we're saying we will trust that students are coming into our classrooms as complex human beings who I'm acknowledging their full humanity I'm acknowledging that they communicate in these ways, that they have these stories to tell. And I need to remove myself from that long held space or idea or notion that I am the bearer of all knowledge and I'm going to teach them. And so that trust means letting go. And it's really tough, right? It's, it's to let go. And it's really tough because we're, we're doing this within this larger narrative in society that is painted bilingual and multilingual learners, especially in the U.S., as deficient, as lacking. 
as opposed to painting them as like these human beings who are just navigating so many complex systems and society that we can learn from. It really, it's going against the current in doing this and this kind of approach where you trust your students and say, I will center your experiences and your lives are valid and I will listen and I will use that in instruction. And that means I will go find texts that reflect that. I will create curriculum around that. And that's, that's tough work because some curriculum that we have doesn't do that. And so it requires us to go against a lot of what we've been trained in. And so I'm very honored that like Luz and I are in spaces in graduate schools and teacher ed programs and visiting schools where we're able to have these conversations. And like we, we talk in one of our chapters, like creating these counter narratives, because that trust is a it's counter narrative to the master narrative of what the learning experiences are in the classrooms. And Luz, at the same time, there's a level of importance there of protecting student safety and how they share their stories too. Is that right? Absolutely. I think when we think about the rhetoric, right, the narratives that we hear, um, just socio-political concepts that we are living in, it's important to consider student safety. Um, there's a lot of immigrant communities that do not trust institutions, and rightfully so. And so it's important that we are able to respect boundaries, right, to, uh, well, first, create a community in the classroom where students feel protected and feel safe and um, feel loved, like I said before. But also just kind of not really force anybody to share their stories, right? Be patient, um, create multiple opportunities for children to be able to share their stories in different ways and with different people. Maybe they wanted to share in their notebooks by themselves. Maybe they want to share with with a partner, you know, and little by little, maybe they will open up to a larger audience. But it's something that we just have to be careful about, just not pushing anybody to share more than they want and more than they're ready for. And just being really open with the community, with the parents about which projects you're engaging with so that they can also support and feel part of this, of this community. And I think that's really impactful thinking about that because if I plan, let's say a personal narrative or memoir writing unit to start like day one of school and I'm having students share without me listening and getting to know their experiences or would they be comfortable doing that? Really, I'm putting them in positions where it shows that I am not listening. I'm not getting to know them. And so I think that's really important. We're just really excited. We're really thankful for the support for this book. I mean, it's been a journey where we've been really thankful that we've had this space to really go through our own journeys as students within systems of schooling, whether they've been welcoming or not, and then also our own journeys as teachers. And then um, I'm just really excited to share this, especially considering the political climate that we're in right now. I think it's important to acknowledge that our students are are taking in messages and are also responding in different ways. And I think it is definitely our responsibility, just like Luz was saying, like sometimes it's not enough. Right. And it's not enough for me to just say, okay, I grabbed this like strategy or I got this worksheet. And it's like, no, we have to do more work to unpack some of our own narratives and journeys around the identities and language practices of bilingual Latinx students. And so for me, I'm just thankful that I had this writing partner in Luz, and then we have the space and we're excited to, to keep the discussion going. Yes, definitely. We look forward to the conversations that will pop up with, you know, when people start getting their hands on the book and we're just so thankful for everything. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Our thanks to Carla and Luce for their time today. You can follow their work on Twitter. Carla can be found at Professora España and Luce at DRA underscore Luce Yadira. Their book, En Comunidad, is available now from Heinemann.com. Learn more and download a sample chapter at blog.heinemann.com. The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. It is produced and edited by Steph George. Sound mixing by Steph George. Our creative producer is Lauren Audette. And our executive producer is me, Brett Whitmarsh. To learn more about the Heinemann Podcast, visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.